you were not awake before, you are now. Thank you. Well, good morning, BUC. Good morning. Whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary or remotely via Zoom or watching the recording later, it's good to connect with everyone. By greeting our virtual neighbors, we build a bridge between online and in-person participation. So first, we'll project on our screen the image of the people who are currently on Zoom and ask them to wave at us. Oh, lovely, lovely. You do what we request. That's wonderful. And now, if you'll turn to the back of the room, turn to the camera, and wave to them, we'll complete the cycle. <laughs> Thank you so much. So today, a town hall meeting will immediately follow the service here in the sanctuary and on Zoom. After the town hall meeting at approximately noon, coffee and conversation will follow in the Hodas family hall to your left as you leave the sanctuary. And virtual coffee hour will also take place immediately after the town hall meeting on Zoom. So whenever and however we connect with BUC, by doing that, we build the beloved community. The campus of Birmingham Unitarian Church occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Bloomfield Hills is situated on land ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We acknowledge Michigan's 12 federally recognized native nations, as well as the historic indigenous communities in Michigan. We are also acknowledging those who were forcibly removed from their homelands, as well as indigenous individuals and communities who live here and now. We affirm indigenous sovereignty, indigenous history, and indigenous experiences. We light this chalice to affirm that new light is ever waiting to break through to enlighten our ways, that new truth is ever waiting to break through to illumine our minds, and that new love is ever waiting to break through to warm our hearts. May we be open to this light and to the rich possibilities that it brings us. Please rise now in body or in spirit and join in singing hymn 301, Touch the Earth, Reach the Sky.
the central task of the religious community is to unveil the bonds that bind each to all. There is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. Once felt, it inspires us to act for justice. It is the church that assures us that we are not struggling for justice on our own, but as members of a larger community. The religious community is essential, for alone our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen and our strength too limited to do all that must be done. Together, our vision widens and our strength is renewed. Do we have Avery to read the story for us? If we do not, I'll read the story myself, and I won't mind a bit. <laughs> a is for answers, but questions come first, as cold drinks taste better when you feel a thirst. B is for beauty and blossoms and bliss. The start of religion is awe for what is. C is for church, one short hour of retreat, but some go to synagogues, mosques, or just meet. D is for difference enriching our lives, where lifestyles are many and openness thrives. E is for equal, where women and men can listen and speak and say no or amen. If I thought about it, I would have changed that language because we're people of all genders can listen and speak and say no or amen. F is for friendly, the way we converse, without always judging who's better or worse. G is for goodness. No, G is for goddess, a name with a twist. Another is God, and they both may exist. H is for hunger, which leads to despair. Although food is ample, not everyone shares. I is for illness, which comes to us all, and helping the sick is a spiritual call. J is for justice, to share all the wealth of earthly resources and safety and health. K is for kindness, for care we can give to all of our neighbors to help them to live. L is for love between people who care, and sometimes two people form into a pair. M is for mysteries we don't comprehend, the sweetness of living, the tears at the end. N is for new, for this faith was invented by people who doubted old faiths and dissented. O is for open like minds that have smarts, to see truth in science and wisdom in hearts. P is for praying, a way to reflect, by words or by silence, then trust and respect. Q is for questions, the leaps of the mind that move you ahead, leave your old self behind. R is for reverence, the awe that we feel. When life seems so sacred, it makes our hearts kneel. S is for spirit, unseen but all-seeing, a name for the mystery beneath all our being. T is for temple, some God's habitat, though some see the cosmos itself as like that. U is for useful, the way we should live to bless those we love with the best we can give. V is for vision that lets us all see a better tomorrow that is yet to be. W is for working at building the earth when peoples of faith see how great is its worth. X is for x-rays that science designed for looking at bones but not spirit or mind. Y is for youthful when vigor is new. And often old people can be youthful too. <laughs> Z is for zero when everything's gone. Some say that is sunset, but some say it's dawn. And now children, youth, and facilitators will meet at the back of the sanctuary before heading to their activities of the morning.
The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, of learning, of service, and of joy. One way we live out the mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in the community. The recipient of our plate sharing in October is the Michigan and, uh, Environmental Justice Coalition, which works to achieve a clean, healthy, and safe environment for Michigan residents most affected by inadequate policies. The coalition takes multifaceted approaches to systems change by altering intersectional goals with statewide power building organizations and small grassroots groups for policy change and disruption. The Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition builds power and unity so all, all can thrive. The morning's offering will now be given and received in the spirit of generosity and gratitude. With much gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good work of our own congregation and the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. Thank you. We hold each other in our hearts and minds with all our joys and all our sorrows. The joys and sorrows of the congregation that are shared with us this morning are these. A joy from Cindy Goldman. She and her husband celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary on October 14th.
from Frederick Sims. Bonnie had her knee replaced last week and she is doing fine. From Carol Jackson, a joy. Both her sons, Zach and Ben Sellis Jackson, are running in the Detroit Marathon today in a race they have dedicated to the memory of their late father, Alex Sellis. And she adds that it is a beautiful morning in the D. We remember those experiencing losses and those facing health challenges. We pray in whatever way we pray for all those affected by war, by hatred and violence. We pray for peace. Even when the cares of the world weigh on us, may we find joy in our connections with each other and in the pleasures that life holds. Let us care for one another and for ourselves in all the ways we can. As we hold each other in our hearts and minds with all our joys and all our sorrows, whether spoken or unspoken, let's take a moment to be quiet together. Here in the space between us and the world lies human meaning. Into the vast uncertainty we call. The echoes make our music, sharp equations which can hold the stars, and marvelous mythologies we trust. This may be all we need to lift our love against indifference and pain. Here in the space between us and each other lies all the future of the fragment of the universe, which is our own. The response is hymn 391, Voice Still and Small. Today's reading reminds me of the work that my wife and I used to do in conducting the new UU program for basically new people who either are coming to this church for one of the first times or have very little knowledge of Unitarian Universalism in the first place. We would gather the first time, we did it with three meetings, three evening meetings. We would gather the first time and people would go around the table and give us their names as we would give them ours. 
And when that had been done, then I said, I have a question for you. It's very simple. And it may be very difficult. Why are you here? <laughs> the reading is an essay written by A. Powell Davies. He entitles it, Is This Your Religion? A. Powell Davies was a mid-20th century Unitarian minister who served All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. He successfully worked to expand Unitarianism in size and in influence. And the Washington Post at the time described him as militantly in the forefront of every assault upon intolerance, discrimination, and injustice. Reverend Davies does not tell us who asks this question, but he starts the essay this way. He asked, is this your religion? And then Reverend Davies writes, we are the consummation of thousands of years of religious history. We are thousands of years that have stripped off superstition and battled with tyranny. Thousands of years that struggled to take fear out of religion, to take it right out of human life. Thousands of years that have marched sometimes joyfully, sometimes in agony, towards spiritual emancipation. We are indeed, we are indeed the consummation of something. Yet in this world of blood and sorrow, it is scarcely important, hardly worth mentioning, unless in addition, we are beginning, we are beginning, we are beginning of something. Unless our religion is new. The religion that has always been new in every prophet who died rather than forsake it. The religion that has been buried over and over again in creeds and rituals and sacred sepulchers and yet has always come to life the religion that today is new all over the earth, stammering itself into utterance in every language to humankind. The religion that says freedom, freedom from ignorance and false belief, Freedom from spurious claims and bitter prejudices. Freedom to seek the truth. Both old and new. And freedom to follow it. Freedom from the hate. From the greed 
that divide humankind and spill the blood of every generation. Freedom for honest thought. Freedom for equal justice. Freedom to seek the truth, the good, the beautiful, with minds unimpaired by cramping dogmas and spirits uncrippled by abject dependencies. The religion that says humankind is not divided except by ignorance and prejudice and hate, the religion that sees humankind as naturally one and waiting to be spiritually united, the religion that proclaims an end to all exclusions and declares a fellowship unbounded, the religion that knows that we shall never find the fullness of the wonder and of the glory of life until we are ready, until we are ready, until we are ready to share it. That we shall never have hearts big enough for the love of God until we have made them big enough for the worldwide love of one another. And then Davies writes, as you have listened to me, have you thought perchance that this, this, this is your religion? If you have, don't congratulate yourself. Stop long enough to recollect, to recollect the miseries of the world, the fearful cruelties, the enmities, the hate, the bitter prejudice, the need of such a world for such a faith. And if you can still say that this of which I have spoken is your religion, then ask yourself this question. What are you doing with it? Yes. 
Religion doesn't mean what it used to. What does it mean to us today as Unitarian Universalists? Time was, most Americans could identify a religious, ident could identify a religious identity as well as a specific religious institution they were affiliated with. Today, the centrality of religion in our culture has shifted. Some have had a crisis of faith, whether faith in God or faith in institutions. Some have been disillusioned by the conflation of religion and politics. Some people have found other things to do on Sunday mornings or Saturday evenings or Friday evenings or whatever time they might have met as a religious institution. There's a trend towards secularization in American society. In those days when almost everybody had a religious identity, it was important to many people to be able to name the religion and the religious institution that they belonged to. When I was in second grade in the 1960s, I hadn't yet discovered Unitarian Universalism, but I had learned that there were different religions that different people belonged to, and I found this fascinating. One day I was visiting with a schoolmate and I asked her, what religion are you? She looked to her mother for the answer. Her mother asked me, what religion are you? And I replied, Methodist. Her mother told me, we're Presbyterian. It's just like Methodist. <laughs> I was terribly disappointed. <laughs> Since I was hoping for something different not just like the religion that my family belonged to. Increasing numbers of Americans say that they identify with no religion in particular. Sometimes they're called nuns, not the kind of nun, of course, who belongs to a religious order, but the kind who answers none when asked, what religion do you belong to? Perhaps 2% of Americans were nuns in the 1960s, and perhaps 40% are nuns today, depending on which survey is consulted. There's a new way of identifying those people who were brought up in a religious tradition but have found that religion 
and spirituality and religious institutions have no place in their lives. Those folks are called duns. <laughs> An article in the UU World magazine recently noted that Gallup surveys show that many Americans are simply giving up church going. The percentage of Americans, says the article, who's, the percentage of Americans who say they belong to a church or a synagogue dropped from 61 to 54 percent over the last 10 years. During that same period, weekly churchgoers -goer, dropped from 30 to 23 percent, while those who say they never attend a service rose from 16 to 27 percent of the population. In recent years, ever-increasing numbers of Americans have identified themselves as spiritual but not religious. Some of you may even think of yourselves that way. But what does spiritual but not religious mean? To be spiritual means that we are aware of the sacredness of life, aware that we are infused with the breath of life itself. To be spiritual is to be in touch with the universe, a commonly accepted definition is that to be religious means to adhere to a particular set of beliefs and practices in keeping with the teachings of a particular religious community. Unitarian Universalism has been called a countercultural religion. Many of us think of that as a compliment. A religion of heretics, skeptics, and contrarians like me. Many of us are rather proud of being countercultural in that and other ways. I have a button that I acquired at General Assembly a few years ago that reads, devout skeptic. <laughs> there are those both inside and outside Unitarian Universalist congregations who would say that Unitarian Universalism isn't really a religion because we have no one set of beliefs, no creed that we all subscribe to. One of my colleagues and I have a running debate about whether Unitarian Universalism is really a religion. She argues that it's not a religion, but a religious movement. I'm almost convinced. Unitarian Universalism is ever-changing, but perhaps the belief that unites us is the belief that each person, child, youth, and adult, has the freedom and the responsibility to develop their own individual beliefs. A classic sociological functional definition of religion, defining religion in terms of the functions it performs for individuals or for society, is that religion is a system of beliefs and practices by means of which a group of people struggles with the ultimate problems of human life. While the content of our individual beliefs, what we think about such things as whether there is a God or the possibility of an afterlife, those beliefs differ widely. There are religious practices we hold in common as Unitarian Universalists, including covenant, conversation, and congregational polity. We are a religion because we are bound, bound by our own choice through covenant to each other in this religious community and a spirit of inquiry and common purpose. And Unitarian Universalist congregations are similarly bound to each other in religious association. The practices and teachings of our religion are not restrictive but freeing. We choose to bind ourselves to each other because we hold that there is value developing our own theological beliefs and spiritual practices within the context of community. That there's value in serving the larger world and reflecting on that service out of the inspiration and motivation that this community provides. One of the purposes of our religious community is to nurture and provide context for individual spiritual journeys. The purpose is to inspire us to bring vitality to our spirits. In turn, we bring our individual and collective vitality to the religious community of which we are a part.
The real meaning of religion, true to the Latin origins of the word, is to reconnect. In church, we are connected. People come to church to be connected, to be connected to each other and to be connected to some larger purpose. They come to church for community. Unitarian Universalist theologian James Luther Adams said that church is a place where you get to practice what it means to be human. Church is the place where we practice our religion, not about a set of beliefs or abstract theological claims, but where we try again and again to be the best people we can figure out how to be. We are where we are united by our willingness to learn with each other and from each other what are the best practices of human beings in community. To practice those ways here in this particular community and to take those best practices out into the larger world. As Unitarian Universalists, our tradition is congregational polity, which means that the congregation is the locus of our governance. I would suggest that the congregation is also the locus of our faith. This does not mean that we share a content of belief, but we share the community in which we live our faith that we human beings have the resources to make the world a better place and that matters that we do this. Religion is institutionalized spirituality. I suggest that by being part of this institution, Birmingham Unitarian Church, you are by definition religious. You can be spiritual alone, but to be religious means being part of a religious community. The church is an institution, a covenanted body of religiously concerned individuals, not just a group of people, not just a place, but an institution in the sense of a specific group of people in a specific place with boundaries however permeable and a covenant of membership that holds them together. The institution is the concrete embodiment of our values, the people and the place, the container, the jumping off point. The church is the place where spirituality and religion intersect. As a congregation, you are institution-based, but you need not be institution-bound. I know that many of you would say that this church and Unitarian Universalism are central in your lives. Some have been members for 50 years and more. Some may be planning to join after the upcoming Getting to Know UU sessions in November. The congregation as the locus and embodiment of our religion can be a laboratory in which to create the world we want to live in. My new definition of religion is that religion is a shared and intentional way of making sense of life and of deciding how best to live. Does that definition fit for you as part of Birmingham Unitarian Church, a Unitarian Universalist congregation? Is this your religion? Who would say yes? Yes. <laughs> Do you care enough about this religion, this religious movement, Unitarian Universalism, and this religious institution, Birmingham Unitarian Church, to share it with others? I hope the answer to that one is yes, too. <laughs> Do you want to grow? And what does that mean? Do you want to thrive? Is the answer to that one yes, also? <laughs> Of course, growth is not just about numbers or dollars. Other modes of growth that church and congregational life experts have identified are maturational growth, organic growth, and incarnational growth. I think there'll be a sermon coming about what those things actually mean, but <laughs> not today. But maturational growth is defined as growth in the spiritual and religious maturity of each member, growth in faith and the ability to nurture and be nurtured. 
So things like small groups, small group ministry, and things like pastoral care associates help to foster that kind of growth, maturational growth. Organic growth is defined as growth of the congregation as a functioning, healthy community, able to maintain itself as a living organism, an institution that can engage the other institutions of society. So partnerships with other organizations in the community, work for economic and social justice, are parts of organic growth. Incarnational growth is defined as the ability to take the meanings and values of the faith story and make them real in the world and society outside the congregation. So those two are ways of just taking your beliefs into the world. And I think it's interesting that those kinds of growth are the kinds of growth that invite people into the congregation, that people want to be part of. So Unitarian Universalist minister Eric Walker Wickstrom suggests that the purpose of religious community is to help its people grow. He writes, if you are who you were, and if the person next to you is who they were, if none of us has changed since the day we came in here, we have failed. The purpose of this community, of any church, temple, zendo, mosque, is to help people grow. We do this through encounters with the unknown in ourselves and one another, in the other, whoever that might be for us, however hard that might be because these encounters have many gifts to offer. So you, may you go forth from here this morning, not who you were, but who you could be. The formula for growth, the way to be countercultural, is to do what you do, do it well, be open to doing it better, and invite your friends May you grow and thrive as a congregation, now and in the days to come. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join in singing hymn 1058, Be Ours a Religion. We extinguish this flame, but not what it means. We become beacons of truth, spreading its warmth to others, glowing bright with passion for life and love of justice. May we live our lives fully and creatively so that we may be a blessing to ourselves, to each other, and to all those whose lives we touch. I invite you to remain seated and still during the postlude taking a few moments for quiet contemplation as the music plays. Then the town hall meeting will follow shortly thereafter. <laughs> 